Protectors of the Suna Suna Protectors of the Suna In Alhamdulillah, Wasalat, Wasalam Allah, Wa Rasulullah. Inshallah, we're going to go ahead and get started on the class for today. And this is our um, Tawheed class. And for this class, we have been discussing. Oh, wait a minute. Let me fix the sound on here. I forgot. Yeah. Sorry. For this class, we've been discussing the jinn. Who are the jinn? Are they our friend or are they our foe? Well, I think it's obvious to everyone that the jinn are not our friends, okay? And what we've been focusing on for the past uh, week is the battle against them, how we spend, you know, every day of our lives fighting against the jinn. And the jinn are so tricky. They're so sneaky. They use different ways to get through to us. And again, they get to us through our personal jinn. Our personal jinn, he hoovers around in our hearts. He never goes to sleep. He knows what our strengths are. He knows what our weaknesses are. And he will prey upon us using them. Who can tell us what are some of the ways in which the jinn what are some of the ways in which your personal gen attacks you that we discussed so far? What are some of the ways that we discussed so far in which the gen will attack us? Anybody? What are some of the ways in which your personal gen will attack you? Assalamu alaikum, Sister Layla. Wa alaikum salam. Um, they give you false hope or make you feel hopeless. In a lot of mercy and stuff like that. Yeah. Mashallah, this is one of the number one ways in which your personal gin attacks you. He knows what your strengths and your weaknesses are. So he'll give you false hopes. And then to the point where he makes you end up losing hope altogether. Okay, any other way? What other way does our personal gin attack us? What other way does our personal gin attack us? Anyone? Assalamu alaikum. He attacks our body. Him. How? How does he attack your body? Um, it attacks your mental part. Your mental body makes you hurt, make you give you pain, make you feel like you're gonna be sick all the time. Um, exactly, exactly. We talked about that. That's very common with women, especially he'll, you know, a woman's menses. He'll make a woman, you know, uh, have a menses, you know, to try to weaken her faith if he can't weaken her uh, any other time because some women are very emotional. But if you're a woman that knows how to not play upon your emotions, he'll come at you through your menses. Okay, good job, Sister Maylion. Also through bad dreams. That's another way, a popular way in which your personal gen will attack you. You know, he'll take on the appearance of people that you love. He'll even take on the appearance of people that, that you desire. And he'll come to you in your sleep and give you dreams about that person. Okay. Also, good job, Maylion. They beautify the things that are bad and dirty. Exactly. They'll make you think that there's nothing wrong with smoking marijuana. It, because it's for medical reasons when there's no such thing as that. Okay, or they'll make it, you think it's okay for a woman to be naked. Okay, they beautify the things that are bad and dirty. How else? Even at death, good job, Sister Sarah. Even at death, they'll come to you and get you to question what you know to be truth in hopes of trying to get you to deny your faith. Good job, Sarah. Also through casting doubt. And this is something that a lot of Muslims suffer from, especially those of you who are strong in your faith. You learn that you come to my classes and learn the religion. You see the hadith, you see the evidence. 
but still, you know, you go around other people and they start making you doubt what you know because they're such good speakers or because everybody else is committing sin. So they like your personal gen likes to cast doubt. And also guys, you know, we talked about how Shaitan's army, his army consists of gin and whom else? Shaitan's army consists of gin and whom else? Salam, hypocrites. Yeah, mankind, the, the, the unbelievers amongst us. So you got the jinn, your personal jinn working against you. And then you go to the mosque and you got the hypocrites, you know, in disguise working against you, trying to cast doubt into your heart, make you question that your teacher is even authentic, make you question that what you're learning is authentic. For example, I had a person just call me right before class. She knows her religion, alhamdulillah. She doesn't suffer with doubt, but there's a lot of weak Muslims out there who would. She knows that there's nothing in Islam that forbids a woman from wearing pants, for example. You will come around these fanatical Muslim men who are so jealous. They'll tell you that it's haram for a woman to wear pants, but where's the evidence? Where's any hadith? Where's anything from the Quran that says a woman cannot wear pants? Again, the law for is clearly defined. And they did have pants in the prophet days. The prophet mentioned about pants during Hajj. And the prophet's wives wore pants. What do you think they put on to ride a camel? SubhanAllah, they didn't spread their legs. And don't tell me about no rada. Because not everybody could afford a rod and they would get on them camels and ride them bareback. You think they didn't have pants on? SubhanAllah, pants were invented by the Arabs and what well, the Persians claim they invented them too. And now the Indians claim. Well, it was, pants were invented by the Arabs, Persians, and Indians. So get that stuff out of here, you know. But for a woman that's weak in her faith, she'll start to question it. She'll forget everything that she learned about how if something is haram, it's clearly defined. If a law doesn't mention that means it's law, she'll forget it if she's weak in her faith. And listen to this man who is a jealous, insecure male who has no evidence on the Quran, no evidence from the Sunnah telling you that you cannot wear a pair of pants. As long as those pants are not tight fitting, as long as those pants do not show the shape of your leg, as long as those pants are harem style or that other the style that Pasha wears, you can, the sales, you can wear. Everybody understand that. So again, we have to be careful of this. You know, the doubt, your personal gen, along with the other allies of Shaitan, the other soldiers, the human soldiers of his army will cause doubt. Okay? So these are some of the ways. And also, even in your love, as Sister Isra said, your personal gen will push you to love your husband, love your mother, love your children more than Allah. And this is wrong. We don't love anyone, not even your mother, more than Allah. And you shouldn't love anyone more than yourself, except Allah and the Prophet. Because how can you save yourself from the hellfire unless you love it yourself? So these are some of the things we talked about. And today we're going to, going to continue to discuss the different ways in which Shaitan and his allies battle against the believers. Let me put the PowerPoint up on the screen. Okay. Hold on, let me set this up so everybody can just see the PowerPoint and not uh, the other stuff. Okay, let's try it again. Okay, so today, again, we're going to continue to discuss how Shaitan and his allies battle against the believers. Remember, Allah tells us in the interpretation of the meaning, oh, you who believe alcohol and games of chance and idols and divining arrows are only an infamy of Shaitan's handiwork. 
So stay away from them so that you may succeed. Shaitan only seeks to cast amongst you enmity and hatred by means of alcohol and games of chance. And he means to turn you away from remembering Allah and from worshiping him. Here you can see in this verse of the Quran that Allah is telling us of other things that shaitan uses to destroy us. When Allah speaks about, mentions strong drink, this he's referring to anything that intoxicates the mind. So not just alcohol, but this includes marijuana. This includes cocaine, crack, crank, anything that makes you high, cigarettes, because nicotine makes you high. Anything that intoxicates the mind, befogs the mind. As Umar told us, anything that befogs the mind is considered khamer, which is alcohol. And when he talks about games of chance, Allah is speaking about gambling. This is playing the number, the lottery tickets. Going to the casinos. How many people go to the casinos and spend all day and night in the casinos gambling? And when he talks about idols, Allah mentions idols. He's referring to anything that's worship besides Allah, such as graves. Some people worship statues. Some people worship graves. Some people worship their children, etc., and so on. And what does Allah mean by divining arrows? He's talking about lucky charms. Lucky charms. Remember, I tell you guys all the time, as Muslims, we don't believe in luck. We believe in the decree of Allah. We don't believe in that crap about if I break some glass, I'm going to have seven years of bad luck. If I step on a crack, that means I'm going to get a broken back. Divining arrows. These are things that people use to decide what course should be followed. Divining arrows also refers to fortune telling, tarot card reading, astrology. Because I'm a born in July, that means I'm a cancer and I got this characteristic and that. This is all shirk. Shaitan increases your interest and curiosity in these things as a means of pulling you away from a law. So that is why Allah is telling us in that verse to stay away from these things because these are the weapons that shaitan uses in his army against us. Your personal jinn will tempt you to call a fortune teller or to go to the tarot card readers. Your personal jinn will tempt you to bet on the number, to play the lottery, hoping that you will hit for a million dollars. And he'll go so far as to tell you that if you win, give half of it to the mosque and you'll be okay, which is not true. So he uses those things against us, okay? Ibn Kathir who was one of the students of Ibn Qayyim, who was one of the students of Ibn Taymiyyah. He told us that Uthman Ibn Affan said, stay away from alcohol because alcohol is the mother of all evils. Look at this fool in this picture. Look at how alcohol brings out your personal gin. Look at how alcohol makes is, is a food, a fuel for your personal gen, brings him out where you act stupid like this idiot is. You do things that you would not normally do in your right mind. How many are the women who are raped? How many are the women who are given drugs at a club and taken to a hotel and raped? Okay, we have to be careful of this. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had told us about a man in previous times who separated himself from his people to worship Allah. And a coveting woman was after him. She sent her slave girl to ask him to come and to be a witness. And when he came, every time he entered a room, the door was locked behind him. 
until he came to a room in which there was a woman with a small boy and a casket of wine. She told him, she said, by Allah, I did not call you here to bear witness, but instead I called you here to have sex with me or to kill this boy or to drink this alcohol. So which one will you do? He took the glass of alcohol and drank it. Afterwards, he told her, give me some more. And he did not finish until he, he had sex with her and he killed the boy. He did everything. So thus, the alcohol is what caused him to do not only uh, uh, drink it, but to have the sex with her and to kill the boy. So again, that's why they say alcohol is the mother of all evil. Because if a person gets drunk, not just alcohol, marijuana, crack, crank, pills, all of that. Because if a person gets high, you know, it'll lead to them having sex and doing murder and everything else. So we really have to be careful of that. Also, we have another hadith that's recorded in Sahih Muslim that one of the Ansar made a dinner for some of the companions and he gave them some alcohol to drink. This is before Allah uh, forbade alcohol. And when they got drunk, they began to boast and then they began to fight with each other. Saud ibn Abu Waqqas was one of the ones injured during the fight. He was struck with a camel's jawbone and scarred for the rest of his life. Why? From just from being drunk and didn't even remember it. Couldn't even remember it. Also in another hadith, one of the companions stood to lead the others in prayer while he was drunk. And, in, and instead of saying, oh, unbelievers, Instead of saying what he's supposed to say, he said, oh, unbelievers, I worship that which you worship. Instead of saying that I worship not what you worship. So again, this is what alcohol does to us. It makes us, you know, uh, not able to concentrate, not able to think, not able to perform our obligations correctly. And as a result, we end up saying things, doing things we shouldn't do. This is not just alcohol, it's any intoxicant, including cigarettes. Why is it you can't fast? Why is it that you can't fast because you want that high? Why is it you can't quit smoking? Because you want that high, you get after eating and sex and all of that. You're addicted to the nicotine, okay? And not only is in our intoxicants bad, but look at gambling. Gambling is also an addiction. It's also a disease. If a person gets involved in gambling, it becomes very difficult to free oneself from it, just as it, it's hard to free yourself from drugs. Gambling is also a means of wasting your time and your money. It also leads to hatred. It pushes you to steal from your loved ones, to argue, to fight. To do, to do what you have to do to get money to support your addiction to gambling. So again, this is why Allah tells us stay away from that. And the same with worshiping idols. Remember, shaitan is the one that encouraged the people to worship idols. And the worship of statues has been so widespread in the past and it's still widespread today. You can travel to many different parts of the world and see people erecting statues and worshiping them. Okay. And this is why Allah loved prophet Abraham because prophet Abraham said, Oh my Lord, keep me and my sons away from worshiping idols. They have led many other men astray. So protect me and my offspring from that. Okay, because again, you know, as humans, it's the nature of the human to look for something, look for someone to worship who we think can help us and benefit us. We find many Muslims today worshiping graves. You find you can travel through the Muslim lands and see Muslims worshiping graves when they notice it's haram. So even the Muslims fall guilty to this nonsense people who call themselves Muslims, not understanding that doing those things invalidates their shahada. Also, another way in which shaitan dupes us is through the unseen. 
Again, your personal gen knows your strengths. He knows your weaknesses. He knows that we're curious about the afterlife. We're curious about, you know, certain things. So he'll seduce us to go to a, a, a tarot card reader. He'll seduce us to go to a fortune teller. He'll seduce us to go to a magician to see if they can predict the future for us. He knows that we have a hard time, for example, accepting death. So he'll attempt us to go and ask, you know, about dead relatives. So again, these are all ways in which the, the djinn, you know, try to dupe us away from our faith. Listen to what Allah says and the interpretation of the meaning. And they follow that which the devils falsely related against the kingdom of Solomon. Solomon did not disbelieve, but the devils disbelieved, teaching mankind magic and what was revealed to the two angels in Babel. So again, you know, you know, so many human beings fall victim to magic and fortune telling and all of that. Also another way in which our evil gen attacks us is through the life of this world and women. And this is for men. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has informed the men that the greatest trial for man is a woman. A woman is so manipulative that if any creature could outsmart shaitan, it would be her. And this is why the prophet ordered us women to cover our bodies, except for the face and the hands. This is why uh, the prophet ordered the men to lower their gaze. This is also why we're not allowed to, to be alone, to be a, alone with a woman or a man who is not a mahram because the temptation is great. Just recently, look how many famous imams, famous imams have been stripped of their fame because they were caught having relations with young girls. Many of those men that you guys listen to, many of them whose mosques you attended, you know, this is why we're not supposed to be alone with someone who is not a mahram to you because the temptation for a man to fall for a woman like that is very great. Okay. And as for the love of this world, so many people fall in love with money and all the spoils of this world that we will we'll lose our religion for it. We don't pray. We don't go to the mosque. We commit all type of atrocities because of money. We don't want to help people. Okay. Also, other tools used by your personal gen is music and singing. Your personal gen wants you to listen to those love songs to make you depressed, to make you lonely, to the point that you will get on the internet and pick up a man. He wants you to watch those sex videos, you know, and so we have to learn to not give in to those desires. So this is why as Muslims, even if it's so-called Islamic rap music, don't listen to it. Also, shaitan will attack us through forgetfulness. He'll make us forget things. This is very, very common. How many of you uh, uh, experience of uh, 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 this, where you actually forget, you know, your prayers, you forget, you know, how many rakats you made, you forget, you know, whether or not you prayed, you know. So forgetfulness, your personal gen will cause you and tempt you to forget things to try to take control over you. Okay. And finally, another way in which your personal gen will try to take you down is through fear. He will cause you to fear men to not wear hijab because you are afraid of what other people will say. You are afraid of what people will do to you. So thus guys, those are some of the many ways in which our personal gen will try to take us out 
take us down. The prophets told us of these things, warned us of these things. We need to take heed. Don't fall victim. Don't fall victim to forgetfulness. Write things down. Don't fall victim to your desires through music. Okay? Don't fall victim, you know, to your gin through these antics. And on that note, we'll stop right here for today. If you guys have any questions or comments, inshallah, you can type them on the screen. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika, a shadow on la ilaha ila anta, stak feruka wa atubu ilaik. Any questions?